And this good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The fact is, his only true name, Yahweh, was obscured for centuries, while the incorrect substitute, Jehovah, was mistakenly put in its place. We find here that it was Paul's manner to worship on the seventh day, Sabbath. There is only one way to be just in Scripture, and it happens through obedience to the Father, and that means His commands and His laws. If there is any one truth that we must understand about the Messiah, it is His heritage. Yahweh saw something in you that He can use. And so he called you as a candidate for everlasting life. He told him that his son's name would be called Yahshua because he would save his people from their sins. When you understand that the New Testament is an extension of the Old Testament, I'd like to welcome you to discover the truth and to say that it's a blessing to be with you today. Recently, we here at Discover the Truth and Yahweh's Restoration Ministry observe the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. For those unfamiliar with these days, let me give you some background. The Passover is on the 14th day of the first biblical month. It was on this night that the death angel came through Egypt and killed all the firstborn of those who had not applied the blood. In the New Testament, our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, died on this day and offered His blood as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. So the Passover symbolizes redemption for both believers in the Old and New Testament. Immediately after the Passover, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is a seven-day observance that anciently commemorated the barley harvest. In the New Testament, though, it represents the resurrection of our Savior. Amazingly, both of these special times were observed by Yahshua the Messiah and His disciples. As part of this feast... Our Father Yahweh commands that we abstain from leavening or yeast, and to eat unleavened bread for all seven days. Now this command is not without purpose. It offers great meaning and symbolism. We find this beginning with Exodus, Exodus 12, verse 15. There it says, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. We find two requirements here. During the seven days of this feast, Israel com was commanded to eat unleavened bread and to remove and abstain from eating leavening. Now we'll find later that this feast also applies to us in the New Testament. Scripture says here that anyone who ate leavening during this time would be cut off from among his people. You know, I find it interesting here that our Father in Heaven first commands that we eat unleavened bread, and only after that we remove the leavening. Even though both of these are important commands, He seems to place more emphasis on the eating of unleavened bread. Once we fully understand the symbolism between these two items, we'll understand why the emphasis. For now, let's consider the meaning within the Hebrew. The word unleavened is from the Hebrew matzah. The Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew Lexicon defines this word as unleavened bread, cake, without leaven or yeast. On the other hand, the word leaven here comes from the Hebrew seor and refers to leaven or yeast. So through the Hebrew text, we find that we're again to eat unleavened bread and to remove leaven or yeast during this very special time. Why is this important? What lesson do we find by eating unleavened bread and removing the leavening? I'd like to first look at the meaning of leavening. You know, Scripture has a lot to say about this. In Matthew 16, verse 6, we find Yahshua the Messiah explaining the, the meaning of leavening. It says there, Then Yahshua said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? Which when Yahshua perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. Or I reason you among yourselves because you have brought no bread. And then we find the key in verse 12 that says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, 
but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. What did Yahshua tell His disciples here? He says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The word beware comes from the Greek proseko and means to pay attention or, or to be cautious. He was preparing His disciples here for an important lesson. When He told them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what was He referring to? Or in verse 12 we find the key. The, final, the, the disciples finally understood the message. He was telling them to be cautious of the doctrine or beliefs of the Pharisees and Sadducees. As believers, we have this same directive and responsibility today. We're to pay attention to, we're to be cautious of the beliefs that we hold. Scripture says to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. We're to prove what we believe. And if those beliefs are true and right, then we're to hold fast. But if not, like leavening, we're to remove. We're to follow in the example of the noble Bereans. The Bible says that they searched the Scriptures daily, proving what they heard. Understand that this is a key lesson of this feast. It's an evaluation of what we believe and whether those beliefs follow that which we find in Scripture. Or let's face it, what we hear from the vast majority is more tradition than truth. Our Father in Heaven, doesn't, he, He's not interested in tradition. He's only interested in those who pursue and follow His truth. You know, the goal and purpose of this program and ministry is to return back to that apostolic era and to teach those truths that were taught and followed by the Messiah and His disciples. As Yahshua again told His disciples here to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, friends, were to do the same. We're to be cautious. We're to be attentive. We're to be alert of what we believe is truth. And for those items that fall outside of Scripture, we're, to, we're again to remove and we're to cast them aside as we would leavening. In Luke 12, verse 1, the Messiah provides another meaning for leavening. We're there in Luke. It says, He began to say unto His disciples, First of all, beware you of the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. We see here another meaning of leavening, and that is hypocrisy. In the Greek, this word literally refers to an actor and is also uh, to deceit or dishonesty. You know, Matthew 23 is known as the seven woes. Within it, Yahshua the Messiah chastises these scribes and Pharisees. He begins each part by saying, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There are few things more upsetting to our Father in Heaven and Savior than hypocrisy. When we worship and obey Yahweh, we must do so in honesty. We must do so without hypocrisy. Again, in other words, we do so in sincerity. In the book of Galatians, Paul says there, Be not deceived. Or we're going to come back in just a short moment. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a short moment. Have you ever wondered why holidays like Easter and Christmas are not found in the Bible? Even more perplexing is the fact that we find special days, like the Passover and Pentecost, being observed in both Old and New Testaments. The fact is, Easter, Christmas, and many of today's popular holidays are not based on Scripture, but evolved from man's secular traditions going back thousands of years before the Savior. Knowing that these days developed from confusion of worship, should we observe them today? And more importantly, why would we not honor the days that our Father appointed in His Word? The holy days that Yahweh established are just as relevant today as they were in Scripture. They are commanded by our Father in Heaven in the Old Testament, observed by the Messiah and His Apostles in the New Testament, and will be established once more in His Kingdom. If you desire to honor the one you worship, we invite you to learn more about the all-important feasts through our free booklet, the Amazing Biblical Feasts. In this eye-opening booklet, we explain why these commanded days are important and how they are to be observed today. And we provide in-depth biblical evidence why these days are required for New Testament believers. As a bonus, we would also like to send you our booklet entitled Easter, The Fertility of It All. 
Request your free booklets now and start your journey towards the keeping of Yahweh's holy days. Welcome back. While well, we might be able to deceive our family, friends, co-workers, or employers, we will never deceive our Father in Heaven. You know, the measure of a man is not what he does in public, but what he does in private. Remember that Yahweh, our Father above, is omniscient. There is no secret unknown to Him. Everything we do, whether in public or private, is known to Him. Understand that those who pretend to be something in public, but another in private, are only deceiving themselves, and more importantly, are not pleasing the one they worship. According to our Savior, this is again another form of leavening, hypocrisy. So as his people were to remove hypocrisy from our lives. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5.1 also provides a meaning for leavening. He says there in 1 Corinthians, It is reported commonly that there is a fornication among you, and such fornication as is is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed in the name of our master Yahshua Messiah. When you are gathered together in my spirit, within the power of our master, Yahshua Messiah, to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our master, Yahshua. For your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Messiah or Passover is sacrificed for us. Paul here is addressing a specific sin that was being allowed by the Corinthian assembly. We see here that a man within the assembly was guilty of committing fornication or incest with his stepmother. What was Paul's verdict here? Paul said that such a one should be delivered and removed from the assembly and again given over to Satan. What was the purpose of delivering this young man to Satan? It was in hopes that someday he would wake up and realize his sin and by so doing, repent. Understand that when we enable and coddle someone in sin, the likelihood is that they will never change. Or in reference to this sin, Paul says here that a little leaven leavens a whole lump. So leavening also represents the acceptance of sin. In this case, immorality. As believers in, not only must we remove sin from our own lives, and this is a calling we all have, but we must not accept habitual sin from others especially among believers. In 1 Corinthians 5, 8, we find Paul providing a contrast between leavened and unleavened. He says there, Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul commands that we observe this feast, and remember, friends, that we're in the New Testament, but not with old leaven. What does old leaven represent? It represents or symbolizes malice and wickedness. In the Greek, the word for malice is kakakia. Strong's defines this word as badness, that is depravity, malignity, or trouble. So at this point, not only are we to purge leavening from our homes, but also from our hearts. This includes false doctrine, hypocrisy, the acceptance of sin, malice, and of course, as we find here, wickedness. In addition to removing the leavening, remember that we're commanded to eat unleavened bread for all seven days of this feast. According to what we find here, what does unleavened bread represent? It symbolizes sincerity and truth. The lesson of this feast is a contrast 
of removing the malice and wickedness from our lives and replacing it with sincerity and a truth. In the Greek, the word sincerity refers to purity. As believers, we're to strive to take in the purity or holiness of Yahweh's truth. How do we worship our Father in heaven? Well, that's a question we need to all answer. Where Yahshua the Messiah provides an answer in John chapter 4, verse 23. John chapter 4, verse 23, he says there, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeketh such to worship him. Yahweh is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. How are we to worship our Father Yahweh? Yahshua says here that we're to worship him in spirit and truth. How do we do this? We have Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, where he provides a key. He says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The letter here, friends, represents a sacrificial law that was unable to cleanse mankind from their sins. As we find from the Passover, the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away sins. It was only able to, to cover. This is why our Savior had to pay the penalty of sin, and by so doing, washing it, removing it completely away. So how do we worship Yahweh in spirit? Or this is done by following, number one, in the footsteps of our Savior. Not only did he obey his Father's word, we know this, but he also understood the intent and reason for that word. It's incumbent upon us as believers to not only obey, but to also strive to apply and understand the spirit and purpose of that which we find in the Bible. This time again represents a contrast between removing that which is impure and taking in that which is pure. The lesson is found all throughout Scripture. For example, in 2 Corinthians 6.14, we find Paul making a statement saying that we are to be une not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Or before we get into that, we're going to take a short break. So stay with us, friends. We'll be back in just a short moment. If you want a Bible that answers the hard questions, then the Restoration Study Bible is for you. This resource offers insight and clarity found nowhere else. The Restoration Study Bible examines the source languages behind the English text to reveal original meanings. In addition to restoring the sacred names Yahweh and Yahshua, this unique Bible has thousands of eye-opening study notes, cross-references, charts, a topical reference, Strong's numbering, and the Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionaries. You can receive your own Restoration Study Bible valued at $60 for a donation of only $25 plus shipping and handling. Order online at yrm.org forward slash Bible or by credit card Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time by calling 573-896-1000. Don't delay. This brand new and fascinating Bible will change your life. As we find from Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, he instructs us not to be unequally yoked. Here's what he says. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Messiah with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel or unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of Elohim with idols? For you are the temple of the living Elohim, as Elohim hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. So what lesson do we find from this passage? 
Paul says here that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers or infidels. To demonstrate his point, he asks here a series of questions. For example, he asks, What concord hath Messiah with Belial? According to Strong's, the word Belial means worthlessness as an epithet, or a word that characterizes Satan the devil. So what he's asking is, is what agreement has Messiah with Satan the devil? Where the answer is obviously none. There is no concord or agreement between our Savior and the evil one. Understand that this same concept applies to us as believers. We're not to allow ourselves to be entangled with those who knowingly reject our Father's word and pursue a life of sin, as Satan did when he rebelled from Almighty Yahweh. In other words, we're to reject the leaven and partake of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. For those who follow the Messiah and keep themselves separate and touch not the unclean thing as we find here, Scripture promises that they will be sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. This is the purpose of this feast, to bring us out of sin and to bring us into the truth of Almighty Yahweh. This is again why we're to replace the leaven with the unleavened. Consider the first example we find in Scripture of this feast. On this day Israel left Egypt, symbolizing sin, to worship Yahweh in the wilderness, representing holiness, representing truth. So from the beginning we find that this time represented a divergence between error and truth. Or we find another example of this contrast in Galatians 5, verse 16. Paul says there in Galatians 5, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the fl flesh lusts after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit or of the Spirit, you are not under the law. We see here that we have a battle ensuing within us. This battle is between our flesh and spirit. Paul says here that these are contrary. Or in the Greek, this word literally means to lie opposite and or to be adverse. You know, a synonym for adverse is hostile. Our flesh, which represents the carnal thoughts and actions of mankind, is hostile to the truth of our Father in heaven. It works to resist and do those things which are in opposition to His Word. This is why Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection or bondage, lest that by any means when I have it preached to others I myself should be a castaway. Now before moving on, what did Paul mean here when he said, but if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law? Is he saying here that those who abide by the Spirit are no longer obligated to obey the commandments? Well, the answer is no. What then is he trying to convey here? What he's, what he's saying is simply this, friends. When we are walking by the Spirit, we are in compliance to the commandments and are therefore not under the penalty of the law. Now what are the works of the flesh? We're starting in verse 19, again going back to Galatians, Paul provides a list. He says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Understand that this list by the Apostle Paul is only a sample of the works of the flesh. Notice here the first four sins Paul mentions. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. These sins are not only commonplace in our nation today, but are being promoted and acceptable as time draws on. Notice the end result for those who follow and pursue the works of the flesh. Paul again says here that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Well, listen, friends, there is a consequence to sin, and that consequence is death. This again is the symbolism of leavening. It represents sin, the acceptance of sin, false doctrine, hypocrisy, malice, and wickedness. This is why we must not only remove it from our homes, but also from our lives. 
Now, how do we live by the Spirit? Or Paul explains this, starting in verse 22. He says there in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Messiahs have impelled the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Paul lists nine unique attributes that define the fruit of Yahweh's Spirit. Those nine attributes are, again, let's review. Number one, love, that is affection or benevolence. Number two, that is cheerfulness or delight. Number three, peace or quietness. Number four, long-suffering or patience, something many of us need. Five, gentleness or kindness. Number six, goodness or virtue. Virtue is so important to believers. Number seven, faith, that is belief or conviction. Number eight, meekness or humility. And number nine, temperance or self-control. These nine attributes exemplify the character of our Father in heaven. If we have a desire to be more like Him, then we must strive to put on each one of these attributes. As our Father says within His word, you shall therefore be holy. Listen, for I am holy. This, again, is a key lesson that we find through this feast. Yahweh's feasts are so important, friends. I want to impress upon you today to study these times, to study the feast days. Through these times, we find our Father's plan of salvation for mankind. Lord, I pray that the time that you've been with us today, I pray that it's been a blessing. I pray that you've learned from Yahweh's Word. And I would hope and pray that you would join us next time for Discover the Truth. And until then, may Yahweh bless you. For today's free offer, call now. Operators are standing by. Dial 1-573-896-1000 or write to the address on your screen. Request online by visiting one of the most extensive religious websites on the internet, yrm.org. Donate by credit card by calling during regular office hours, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time, or give online, donate.yrm.org. For a one-time yearly donation of $25 or more, we would like to send you a gift, a one-year subscription to our bi-monthly Restoration Times magazine. This magazine will unlock Bible truth that will simply amaze you. For more information or to read online, visit RestorationTimes.org. Get your copy of the Restoration Study Bible, the only Bible like it in the world, by calling during regular office hours or by visiting RestorationStudyBible.com. This one-of-a-kind amazing resource will quickly become your Bible of choice. Join us next week as we take a journey of understanding, walking the pathways of the Messiah and His Apostles, exploring the Hebraic origins of the faith, and carving away tradition as we discover the truth.